welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to talk to you today and, and have this conversation. I can see you. I'm looking out the window. You're right down the road in <laughs> Huntington Beach. Where are you? Newport, Fashion Island? Uh, Newport Coast, so a little bit south of Newport Beach. Looking out the window, said, it's very great, very gray and hazy day today. Well, we were chatting, uh, you know, some some telescope economic indicators on the cargo ships. I mean, that was a big Barron's cover story. And you said you woke up and they were cleared out and thought, wow, man, this is this is going to be an indicator. I'm going to have to work into my my newsletter. But uh, but there's a little a little more play, right? Yeah, I was, you know, the last couple of weeks, there's been six or seven ships parked outside of and that we could see which is pretty unique like we've never I've, I've only lived out here three years I've never seen any cargo ships outside my window but um they were cleared out this morning when I looked out and I was optimistic that maybe we were starting to see the Long Beach ports start to you know clear some of the inventory but unfortunately I don't think that's the case I think they're just moving them um further north given the oil spill that happened over the weekend so Unfortunately, yeah. it took an environmental disaster to to get the cargo ships to move. Yeah, I uh, may have to put surfing off for a few more days. I'm not sure. Um, that was one of my biggest adjustments, by the way, moving to Los Angeles from um, other towns is often like you walk on the beach or come home and you look down and he's like, what's that smell? You got a bunch of tar on your feet. That's never happened to me on the East Coast, um, but they say that's natural. Uh, all right, so you are a East Coast transplant. Um, you have a pretty storied resume. I want to hear the Aaron timeline. Um, we got 0.72, more Lehman Brothers, City, UBS, all in the mix, and now at PIMCO. Uh, tell me the progression. What was, uh, what was the entree to markets for you? So I, I graduated from Georgetown in, in 2001. Um, I started off, actually, at Georgetown as a pre-med student. My dad had me take six years of Latin. In, in high school. So I figured I'd put it to work and become like a, like a um, which, which is absolutely useless, you know, as, as a foreign language to, to study. Um, but I, I started off and thought I'd put it to use as a pre-med student. Um, ended up taking a class, I think my sophomore year at Georgetown and, and fell in love with economics and sort of the rest is history. Um, I sort of blindly went into my summer internship at my junior year at Lehman Brothers um, and didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but really loved it, Was just loved the energy, the passion that you know my coworkers had and the fact that every day was a different day. And I, I sort of haven't looked back since then. Um, outside of three, a, a brief three year stint in investment banking, uh, which just started my career. Since then, I've been really immersed in macro. Um, at a number of macro firms that you mentioned, more capital. Um, I, I ran city macro trading for, for a brief while um, and then moved over to 0.72 SAC. Um, and then most recently, prior to PIMCO, was at UBS, um, both running a macro fund at UBS O'Connor and then eventually becoming the head of asset allocation at UBS Asset Management, which led so me out west and led me to PIMCO. The land of milk and honey. Um, there's there's a couple of fun, funny jumping off points, totally unrelated to really anything, which is the way this podcast goes. Um, I remember taking, as you referenced, Latin utility. I, I mean, I took Latin in high school. I was sleeping during one class, and this is when we were doing a Latin play. So the entire thing was in Latin, and of course, being sleeping. Uh, got appointed to be the lead in the play, which means you had to memorize <laughs> most of the lines. And I, I didn't know what any of the words, but just memorize the entire play. Um, have very painful memories from that. But I would have definitely overlapped with you. Uh, you know, I was a Virginia guy, but lived in D.C. Uh, uh, 2000, 2001. So probably cross paths on, on M Street or elsewhere down by the waterfront. Um, all right. So uh, uh, does does part of the macro time at Moore, were you helping the macro trade of, of uh, was it, were you there when Bacon bought the ski mountain? Is that considered like a, a macro, uh, didn't he buy a Taos? Am I, am I getting that right? He, he, that was, a lot of that was po part of his personal investment. So that yeah. was not part of his, his formal, you know, under yeah. the, the more capital umbrella of our yeah. investor class. It sounds like a pretty good hedge, though, you know, I um, inflation and everything else uh, as well. All right. So tell me about like kind of your evolution of framework. You know, macro means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
Um, some people, it means a lot more economic subjectivity. Others, it means a quantitative technical mindset based on prices only. Uh, certain others, it's short term. Certain others, it's multi years. Some people, it's cross asset classes. Some people, it's only uh, in one. Tell us a little bit about kind of how uh, you think about the world and how uh, that's evolved over the years. And then we'll start to get into what the world looks like today. So I would say yes and yes to, to your answers, um, which is, I think, firstly, it had my, my philosophy and my framework has evolved pretty dramatically, I would say, over the last. 15, 20 years, although it's been a little bit of a continuum. Um, where I am today is I sort of combine both very much a quantitative approach as my starting point, my launch point for how I evaluate markets and opportunities, and then overlay a discretionary, um, you know, sort of point of view on top of that, that very quantitative approach. So we start at sort of the, the bottoms up, which is our long-term strategic asset allocation, which is our really where our landing point is over the next three to five years. Like, we're, what do we think because of supply demand dynamics, because of long-term capital market assumptions, what do we think the, the sort of strategic landing point for investments are going to be? And that just gives us a valuation anchor where we think we'll sort of gravitate to over the secular or the you know sort of next three to five year horizon. On top of that, I've worked with our analytics team at PIMCO, um, and I did the same at UBS O'Connor, to develop a, a more of a short-term tactical asset allocation model, which really looks at different market indicators and economic indicators to really give a sense of where we are in terms of the economic cycle, uh, as well as where we are in terms of the business sentiment uh, and financial conditions to help really frame where I think asset classes are going to go over the next really three to six months. And so this, I think, gives us a much better sort of pulse on where economics are heading and ultimately how asset classes shake, shake out on the back of that. Uh, and so that really is our sort of starting point for how I think about how to invest over the the medium short to medium term. You know, when I when I look at investments, I'm always thinking, you know, how our asset class is going to perform over the next three to six months. I think, you know, getting the next one to two week trade is difficult. Um, it's much easier to think over, you know, a, a very short cycle, uh, or at least over, you know, a macro thematic trade um, time frame, which I think, you know, typically is inside of a year. Um, so that's really the, the sort of starting point. And then on top of that, I, I layer on sort of systematic trades, which tend to really look to seek to generate alpha on a systematic basis, where I think there's sort of dislocations in the market. Um, and then on top of that, there's a discretionary overlay, which is a lot of the relative value trading that I do. I think when I started my career, there was a lot more RV trading. Good. Let's dig in to where all that elusive alpha is hiding today. You know, there's a lot of current market topics that everyone's talking about. But um, as we look around the world, you can kind of pick the starting point for what is the main um, entry, entree into what uh, you're thinking about or looking at. Maybe is there a particular driving force, whether it's inflation, whether it's interest rates, whether it's valuations, like where should we, where should we begin? Here and we're recording this in uh, early October 2021, the beginning of fall. I think the starting point for asset class investing is always growth. What does the growth opportunity look like? Is it are we where are we in terms of the economic cycle? And and ultimately, you know, how does the future look over the next six months, over the next one year? And I think you know, starting with growth as our, our starting point, you know, I think that the outlook is still fairly robust. It's certainly slowing from what we saw over the last year or so in the post-pandemic period. But when you look at corporate balance sheets, uh, household balance sheets, they still look very healthy. And there still is a lot of cash that's sitting on the sidelines, which makes me optimistic that we still have a lot of runway to go in terms of the growth outlook. There's certainly been, because of the ports situation that we talked about uh, earlier in this conversation, there certainly is some friction points, which is leading, I think, temporarily to a slower growth outlook. But that also, I think, extends the, the period of growth over a longer time frame. 
That said, we are slow are starting to see inflation start to pick up and start to percolate. And that I think is one of the biggest risks out there. It certainly has implications with respect to the Fed and, and interest rate policy. It also you know, potentially could eat into margins at a faster clip than the market's anticipating right now. Same with household balance sheets. I mean, gas prices at the pump. You're out here in California. You know they're they're you know north of four dollars and fifty cents uh, in most places around at least around um, the coastlines and in some areas they're as, as much as five dollars a gallon. I mean it's it, it's you know we're far cry from where we were, you know twelve to eighteen months ago. I, I think that that's starting to eat into household balance sheets at the same time when a lot of the stimulus payments are, are rolling off. So that to me is the biggest risk factor out there, and you know, certainly people are starting to talk about it, but there, I, I don't think that people are talking about it nearly as much as they should be right now. Yeah. And so, I mean, what, what are sort of the indicators or your thoughts on, on inflation, like to, to the extent that it is increasing, you know, and you can comment more on that if you want, you know, where is that going to have the most impact? I mean, I think it's easy for people to talk about bonds, um, you know, equities, do you think it helps or hurts? depending on, uh, on what they are, what they're doing. What, what are sort of the, some of the, the knock-on effects over the next six months, three years, uh, as, you, as you look on the horizon? So, so firstly, I think as Americans, we're a little bit, um, we're a little bit of a privileged position with regards to sort of what I, what I see as a looming energy crisis uh, on a global basis. You look at Europe. I mean, natural gas prices there are skyrocketing. Um, you know, they 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 were up almost thirty percent, I think, overnight. Um, and same thing with yesterday. You had pretty explosive natural gas price appreciation. You're starting to see that filter through into Asia as well, which are much more sensitive to um, energy costs than than certainly we are in the U.S. right now, just given the fact that the U.S. Um, energy prices haven't accelerated nearly at the same clip as we've seen across Europe and Asia. What you're seeing on the back of that is you're starting to see some companies actually have to curtail or shut down um, their production lines. And so China is now making decisions in terms of where what regions or what businesses can continue to produce and which ones have to you know shut down temporarily um there you're also starting to see a number of utility providers in europe i think there were five or six in in the last month or so in in the uk which have gone out of business um and and you're also starting to see decisions being made and even here in the us in terms of what plants to plant, I guess is the right word. Um, but, but but making the, the decision in terms of the trade-off between corn versus soy, corn is a more fertilizer intensive crop to, to plant uh, versus soy and wheat, which are lower fertilizer intensive. And if fertilizer prices continue to rise, you may start to see farmers making those type of economic decisions in terms of you know, which plants to, to plant the season. So you are starting to see inflation or really start to influence business decisions. And I think that that's really, we're really at the starting point of that right now, because we're only, you know, a month or so into this explosion in energy prices that we're seeing. I don't think that the equity market has fully woken up to that fact. When you look at earnings expectations and the expectations for margins, there's been a lot of talk about supply chain shortages. There's been a lot of talk about um, interest rates, you know, pot potentially rising and the impact that that's going to have on, on balance sheets and corporates. Um, but you haven't seen yet a lot of talk about the margin impact that rising energy prices could potentially have to different pockets of, of um, of business. And so I think that that's really the, the next, you know, sort of conversation to be played out within equity markets. Yeah. And so, I mean, as, as we take that thesis to the next step, I mean, you know, I look back over the last couple of years, I mean, it's, it's been kind of bananas. We were talking about on the podcast last year, just looking at the energy sector as the equity sector and just saying how crazy, you know, it's been over history where at one point, um, it was like a third of the S and P almost, and and then it got as low as what two or three percent, I think, at yep. the bottom. And then, not surprisingly, is having a absolute ripper of a year this year. Um, 
you know, do, do you think that like, what's the sort of positioning when you think of this? Is it, hey, look, you want to be long energy companies? Is it actually you want to be long commodities? Have they moved too far too fast? Is And when you say commodities, you know, obviously, it's not one general um, asset class. There's a lot of granularity, you know, precious metals have been doing poorly. Why? And this is personal to me because I manage, we have a farm in Kansas that I managed to sell all of our wheat about a week before it ripped up. So my timing is always <laughs> atrocious on this, by the way, <laughs> listeners. But what are sort of like the the implications, do you think? Is it something that um, investors, because most investors I talk to are, are rarely, if ever, unless they're Canadian, allocated to energy and commodities in general. What's, uh, what's your sort of general thoughts? Well, I think over the secular horizon, I think you want to be invested in those commodities that are going to play well into the adoption of ESG. So I think over, you know, whether that's copper, because there's going to be a much higher copper content in ESG friendly build out of infrastructure than what you see today. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a good long term secular play. But if we're just talking about the here and now and what's going to do well over the next three to six months, you know, I do think that as we get into winter, I think natural gas prices and, and U.S. energy prices in particular, which have lagged the rest of the world, will continue to do well, particularly if we, you know, go into a colder winter season, this, this you know, sort of upcoming winter. Um, and so, I, you know, I do think that that energy likely does well. But then you also have to think, like, what are the substitution, um, you know, sort of commodities that are going to be tightened because of a tightness that we're seeing in the energy markets play out, you know, whether it's coal, whether it's, it's still an aluminum because they have to close down factories because they don't have enough energy to, to keep, you know, the same supply of factories open in China and in, in the U.S. You know, I do think that you're going to start to see, you know, some real decision making happening that is going to have a much broader impact across um, commodities than just the energy sector as well, you know, in and of itself. And so I think those materials and those raw commodities that need energy as a higher input are going to be the ones that are likely going to see tighten supply into the winter months. And that's probably the, the right places to be long right now. So I think industrial metals as well as energy you know, sort of commodities are, are likely to continue to do well over the next, you know, sort of three to six month horizon. You know, commodities tend to have, um, and this is just kind of like Econ 101, um, a way of bouncing out over time horizons. You know, low prices um, get cured by companies shutting down and production and high prices, vice versa. You know, how much of this, I mean, we've seen the craziness with lumber and we've seen it with natural gas in Europe. Do you think it's something that this kind of cures itself in the next year? Or is this is this going to be something we're going to be dealing with for the next three, five, 10 years? I mean, is this just like the craziness, all pandemic, just flush of, uh, you know, all the all the systems getting uh, jacked up over the past year? Or is this actually like a, something that you foresee is could be a sustainable reality? This is a really good question, because there's a supply and demand element to this conversation. I think on the supply on the demand side, yes, you've seen, you know, great greater usage or greater need for goods at this um, you know, sort of post-pandemic, um, as, as we exited the post-pandemic period, we've seen a much more physical rebound in terms of physical goods this time, uh, as opposed to past recessionary periods where, or the exit of past recessionary periods where it was much more of a service-driven or service-led recovery. This has been much more of a physical goods recovery, which is very distinct from past, you know, sort of periods of, of rebounds that we've seen out of recessions, uh, at least relative to, to recent history. So there is definitely a demand side that's, you know, fueling, I think, a lot of the appreciation that we've seen in, in the energy sector, as well as in the, the metals and, and material sector over the last uh, few months. But I think it's also largely being driven by supply. And I think this is the much bigger factor that's led to the, the current climate that we're in right now. It's a couple of different threads that are driving this. The first is ESG adoption. So you have seen an underinvestment in new supply across energy over the last couple of years because of the sort of ESG adoption, because financing to 
the energy sector has gotten more, you know, somewhat more expensive. Um, and, and I think that that has curtailed the investment in new, you know, new mi either new mines in the industrial side or new exploration on the energy side. And so that sort of materially under investment has led us to, you know, potential supply, this the supply place story where we are right, to, you know, right now um, and, and here today. I think in addition to that, you have seen um, China also making, I think, decisions to underinvest, um, you know, particularly in some of their infrastructure that and really curtail, um, particularly in the northern region, investment um, because of ESG. So it's not just a US or and European you know, sort of conundrum that we're facing, but you're seeing it across China as well. And, and with respect to China, the trade deal uh, of the trade tensions that they've had with Australia has also curtailed their imports of coal from Australia into China. So they've been sort of undersupplied with respect to coal because that was one of the largest imports, you know, prior to the trade tensions that emerged uh, over the last 18 months or so. Um, in addition to that, um, there's certainly, I think, you know, a, there's been a number of natural disasters and, and weather impacts that have shut down production, both in terms of the energy sector as well as in the industrial sector over the last few months or so, and that also curtailed supply. So I think there's a number of factors that have led to the current environment that we're in. Some of them, you know, potentially could clear quickly, um, but, but I think some of them, particularly when you talk about the underinvestment, you know, is, is a longer term sort of structural challenge that we, that we face right now and is likely not going to be cleared over the next sort of three to six months. You know, even if you were to start to build out new capacity, it's going to take time for that capacity to be built out. And so I think that that is going to lead to a little bit of a longer sort of leeway in terms of the, the, the challenges that we face. And I don't think that we're going to see this, you know, necessarily uh, ameliorated in the very short term, unless we see a very, very mild winter, which could probably clear a lot of these problems uh, in the shorter term time frame. I'm looking for some snow out west, so it can be mild, but <laughs> snowy. Um, what's, um, so talk a little bit about investing implications. Are there any pockets of opportunity um, on either time horizon you're looking at when, and we can stay in sort of the, that, that um, thought space of, um, you know, commodities, but also uh, equities and rates. I mean, what, what I, I feel like a lot of people have struggled when I talk to them about why precious metals have kind of done so poorly relative to a lot of the other commodity complex, but any general thoughts, like where should people be putting their money, um, you know, on this trade? Is there an opportunity or is it more just like, hey, you should have a set allocation and, and sit pat? So there's been a lot of you know talk about real rates moving higher, and I struggle to see how real rates are going to move materially higher. A with a very gradual Fed that doesn't seem like they're you know willing to really rock the boat too quickly, too fast. Um, and then secondarily, with the fact that you're seeing commodity prices rise at the clip that they are, um, which obviously you know feeds into break-even yields, and and that I think is going to keep real yields you know quite low. So that actually when you think about it, isn't necessarily a bad environment for, you know, equity investors. But I do think that you have to move away from some of the more defensive sectors, um, some of the more secular growth players that have done well over the last couple of years and, and think about, you know, moving into some of the later cycle investments, which tend to be, you know, more of the cyclical sectors in the economy. So whether it's industrials, metals, mining, you know, you know, some sort of select energy players, I think that those are likely the ones that are going to outperform. You've also just seen, um, because of the pandemic, you know, some pretty significant dislocations in equity assets as well. Real estate, I think, is is one of the big ones. The travel and leisure sector. So, you know, sort of absent this whole energy, you know, discussion that we've been having, I, I still think that there are laggards from the 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 pandemic that likely will continue to do well as we you know continue to normalize. We see people go back to work, resume travel, you know, go back to more of their daily life. And so, I still like the hotel, leisure, hospitality sector, which I think will likely you know do well. You know, particularly as we move past the next couple of months. What do you think about U.S. stocks in general? You know, we've had a monster 
run, not just um, since the pandemic, but really this entire cycle post financial crisis, particularly re relative to the rest of the world. Um, talk to us. We can start with the U.S. in general, and then we can move around the world as you see fit. Like what what uh, what role do valuations play? You said you used to talk a little bit, still do about relative valuations, but what's um. What's the world look like uh, here in end of 2021? 20, I almost said 2020. Um, how's uh, how things look there on the on the general equity side? So I think valuations, if you're thinking about valuations over a short time frame, you're likely going to be disappointed um, in using them as a you know sort of the your benchmark for how asset classes should perform. I think you know valuations tend to work well over a five to ten year time frame. And they really only tend to well, work well when you're seeing valuation well in excess or well under what their you know sort of long-term strategic value should be. So if you see you know equities that are two standard deviations above the long-term sort of fair value, that's probably a good time to sell equities over the next 10 years. But as an investor that cares about the daily mark to market, or at least the, the monthly and quarterly mark to market, that you know probably isn't going to be that helpful. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, I think that there's something, you know, I think that valuations can be useful, but that you have to understand when they're useful and the time frame that you're thinking about. Um, on a relative valuation basis, the U.S. always commands a relative premium to the rest of the world, and, and I think it's justified. I think that structurally, the U.S. has advantages. Uh, it's more business-friendly climate. It, the innovation and productivity tends to be higher than the rest of the world, at least the rest, the rest of the developed market economies. Uh, in addition to that, just the way that we are, the, the, the S&P 500 is sort of structured with a much higher weighting towards technology than what you see, you know, certainly out of Europe also is a structural advantage um, because you're investing in higher productivity, higher growth companies just because of the way that the S&P 500 is designed. So I think that, that U.S. equities, you know, tend in most market environments will tend to outperform unless you're at you know very significant extremes or unless you're at a point where another region is at an inflection point with respect to growth that's going to materially outpace the US. And I don't think that we're there right now. I think that, US, that Europe has had a good run uh, over the last six months or so. It's performed relatively in lockstep with the US, but the energy crisis is going to hit Europe a lot harder than it's gonna hit the US over the next you know, sort of three to six months. And so they're at a pretty, you know, sort of pivotal position, you know, uh, pivotal point right now where I think you're going to start to see underperformance. Um, with respect to China, I think China has become largely a very, I don't want to say uninvestable place, but a very difficult to you invest can say place. It. I, you can say whatever, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really difficult as, as an institutional investor right now to invest in China, given the fact that there's just not clarity about what the, you know, what the regulatory regime is going to look like over the next, you know, sort of year or so, or five years. Um, you know, they continue to take a very sort of autocratic, um, approach to the way that they're you know sort of shutting down uh, different businesses or different business lines make it difficult to you know continue doing business as usual whether it's the education sector whether the healthcare sector the gaming sector video game sector um you know internet as well and so you don't know what's the next shoe to drop and so as a result of that you know as an investor it's very difficult to, to put money to work there and so while valuations have gotten really cheap and there's a lot of good companies in China you don't know if they're going to be able to do business as usual they're going to be able to grow in the same way over the next five years and so we're, we're taking a little bit of a wait and see approach to the way that we're thinking about investing in Chinese equities right now um, yeah. I think Outside of that, you know, emerging markets also are at a difficult point. If you have slowing growth and tightening monetary policy, like emerging markets typically don't do well in that environment. So, you know, I, I rather stick with the U.S. for now as my overweight um, and, and, you know, sort of wait and see uh, for the rest of the world and wait for valuations to get a lot more attractive and, and um, you know, things to stabilize before I step back in. At what point do you think that um, that 
inflation becomes a problem in the U.S. where it starts to affect, uh, you know, multiples or what people are willing to pay? Or like, do, do you see that as something as a big concern, minor concern, no concern at all? I think you're going to have winners and losers. Typically, if you just think of it on a very macro basis, when inflation gets above, you know, three to three and a half percent, that's when you start to see it impact multiples. And so, and that would be sort of sustained over a longer time frame. You have started to see inflation expectations on the longer term rise, um, but they're still, you know, fairly muted over a very long sort of time horizon. And so while people are buying into short term inflation, rising because of these supply constraints, because of sort of temporary factors. I don't think that people have really bought into yet that the long-term inflation expectations are going to be materially higher. I mean, most people, most economists, most sell-side analysts still expect that inflation is going to move back down throughout 2022 and sort of settle in the mid-2% range at the end of next year. Um, if we were to start to see longer term inflation expectations rise and, and sort of sustain that higher level, you know, I think that that would definitely eat into sort of margins and, and um, eat into the, the expectation for multiples. Um, we're not there yet. I do think, though, people are being a little bit um, sort of overly optimistic when they sort of price out what their expectations are for margins next year. I think you're going to see a, a lot more disappointment on the margin side that when people are estimating it's probably not going to hit the third quarter it may not even hit the fourth quarter but i do think it's going to hit 2022. no i spent a lot of time thinking about when you think about certain markets um one idea that sits in my brain is um an environment where the current cohort of portfolio managers analysts and everything else haven't experienced it you know and so um, in the U.S., I mean, most managers haven't really experienced like an inflationary type environment, right? You got to go back quite quite a ways till um, the '80s, and you know, you and I were uh, playing Nintendo at that point, probably versus um, you know the '70s and, and prior. I mean, this reminded me of 2008, which was sort of a crisis that really didn't have some similar analogs, probably more similar to the, the depression sort of bust than, than others. And, and thinking about other things like extrapolating to talking to friends in Japan who have lived there for the past 20, you know, 30 years, most have experienced a very distinct world that is, is different than what it was the, you know, prior to boom time. So I wonder how much like the mindset of theoretically, if there is inflation, is it something that people, um, you know, or, or even know how to adapt to and what sort of effects that has. I don't know. Um, I'd spend time noodling a lot of these things. It doesn't really affect anything I do, but think about it. It's more of a happy hour discussion. No, I think that's a really good point. I remember listening to a speech by Abe when he first took over as, as the leadership position in Japan. And he said something to the effect that he was going to break through the bedrock of, of uh, you know, sort of inflation expectations and uh, the Japanese sort of psyche with respect to inflation. Um, and, and he, you know, he tried really hard with his, you know, sort of abonomics and his, his three arrows um, of abonomics in order to do so, put a lot of sort of might and muscle behind it. And yet still, you know, inflation expectations in Japan barely budged. I mean, they, I think they budged for a couple of quarters and that was about it. Um, I think you're right. It's really hard to, um, to, to sort of break that mentality. I, you know, just as an example, my mom was born in 1937. So she's approaching 84. She's pretty, you know, she's pretty seasoned. Um, and she grew up in the depression. I mean, she would tell me stories about growing up and, and she grew up in, in not a wealthy household. It was a pretty poor household. Her, her father, my, my grandfather was an electrician and worked three jobs. Um, and would, was barely home because one of his jobs was in Philadelphia and he lived in Brooklyn. So he was commuting back and forth on the train to, to Philadelphia for his engineering uh, jobs. And so my mom would chew gum and then she would actually save the gum under her, 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 dr her dresser or under her um, bedside table so that she could chew it the next day. Like that. And, and they would make tomato soup by get, buying ketchup packets and mixing it with water. And that's sometimes what they'd eat at night for dinner. 
Um, and, and so to this day, my mom, who who has done you know very well, and my dad, who's done very well in their um, you know careers, and have saved up a, you know a, a pretty nice nest egg. To this day, my mom still has that exact same mentality. She's always worried about you know how she's going to pay the the next bill, even though they have you know plenty of assets to pay the bill. You know well into well beyond what their sort of natural lifespan is going to be. You know I remember growing up, we were clipping coupons every weekend. Um, and my mom was only buying, you know, you know, brandless, um, you know, sort of cereal or, or flour or, or whatever it was. It's still that mentality um, where my, my parents still shop at Costco and refuse to buy anything outside of Costco, including clothes. Like they think that that is like the end all be all for, for shopping. So, you know, it, it's really hard to break that mentality. And I think that what you grow up in is largely how the lens that you see the world and largely how you see the world. So I think that you're right, like the current generation of investors haven't lived through a, an inflation scare, um, likely don't know how to sort of position for that. And, and certainly we can all study and look at what assets perform well during inflation environments, but without having that experience, it makes it very difficult, I think, to you know appropriately factor that into your investment uh, framework. Yeah, I had so many thoughts as you were talking about that. I mean, I, I definitely have a lot of fondness talking to my father and, and grandparents when they were alive about um, those times. And um, there is a great book called The Great Depression, A Diary. Listeners, if you um, want to read a little bit about uh, that period in particular, but there um, to give you some perspective. And second, the lesson is if you go over to Aaron's house, uh, the parents, <laughs> whatever you do, don't put your hands under the breakfast room table because it'll just be yeah. covered in gum uh, uh, reserves for uh, the pandemic uh, part two. Um, how does this sort of fit together? You know, um, I feel like us macro folk could sit at uh, and chat for 10 hours on, on these topics. And, and I love to, um, but part of what we talk about on the show and, and elsewhere is like, are right, you have the diagnosis and then like, what's the prescription? Meaning how does this actually impact what you end up doing in the portfolio? And so do you start from like a target allocation and then move away? Is it a situation where you start with a blank page and then add things from the recipe book? Like how, how does the, the chef kind of put it together? Yeah, so that, that's actually where we use that strategic asset allocation. That sort of that starting point is that is our long term sort of allocation of how we should think about, you know, where where our landing point should be over the next, you know, sort of three to five years. And so that's our starting point. And then we'll move away from there based on what we think the the nearer term horizon and the near term investment landscape is likely to bear for us. So, you know, as that that starting point, um, for us, actually, it's uh, most of the funds that I manage are 6040 funds or target date funds that have, you know, sort of a, a, a sort of defined glide path for uh, investing over, you know, a longer time frame. Um, and then for 6040 funds, we'll use that as our starting point and then move away from it, you know, based on, you know, how much um, we think like 6040 is likely to dominate over the next couple of years. I also do run some absolute return strategies where it's a little bit more of a blank slate. And so we'll build up rather than, you know, use a, a benchmark as our starting point. Um, but for all of them, I think that the the, the philosophy and the way that we sort of manage um, the funds are is pretty similar um, in terms of really overlaying those shorter term views in terms of how we think you know, assets are likely to perform uh, over the next year or so. Um, so right now, you know, I, I think we're probably somewhere in the mid to moving into the later cycle environment. And so as a result of that, I want to be, you know, more invested in commodities, more invested in sort of asset classes that are going to be kind of positively convex to inflation rising and sustaining a higher level. And, you know, being a little bit away from in investments that I think are going to fare poorly in that either because inflation is going to be, you know, higher than what the market's anticipating or because leverage, they, they have, they run with high leverage. And, and if, you know, you start to see either growth slow, inflation higher than expected, input costs higher than expected, they're going to run into real problems. And I think, you know, right now we've been in an environment over the last couple of years where liquidity has been flush, where, you know, assets that maybe shouldn't have 
been in existence or shouldn't have been funded at the levels that they have been funded uh, were ripe with liquidity and you know we're able to keep the lights on because of that and so I do think that there's you know real opportunity to be to pick your spots to be short the market right now that you know probably aren't going to fare well in either a higher inflation lower growth or less li liquid environment yeah and so um how much latitude is there? Like, how weird are you guys willing to get? Is it like, do you have the mandate where they're like, you know what, Aaron, you can straight up go 100% cash and bonds if the world's ending? I assume that's not the case. But like, what's the what's the sort of tolerance bands, or is there um, ability to, you know, um, could you move the portfolio short? Could you say, you know what, I'm just going to go relative value China versus U.S. and that's that. I mean, how how much sort of uh, um, weirdness do they allow you to? To, to do over there? It really depends on the fund and mm -hmm. because I run like sort of run a, a pretty wide range of funds. It, it, it really is, you know, sort of- Tell us about the weirdest. Specific. Tell us about the well, big, uh, the most latitude. What I think what's the most interesting and that PIMCO does the best, and this is across my funds and, and across um, other funds as well, is that because of our size, our scale and our balance sheet, we're able to actually invest in like pretty weird assets that we think are have you know a really attractive convexity profile in terms of the payoff um, that other funds probably you know won't touch or wouldn't do or just don't get the the look on. So whether that's you know account receivable financing, whether that's some of the private deals that we you know sort of participate in. Um, I, I think what's the sort of the weird, the fun and sort of interesting and sort of weird stuff is is more about the the asset classes that we play in and what we invest in rather than, you know, sort of risks that we're taking. We tend to be, uh, you know, somewhat conservative in terms of the risk that we're taking, or appropriately conservative in terms of the risk that we're taking. Um, but but we're willing to sort of traffic in asset classes that I think a lot of people don't even get the looks on um, just because of you know, sort of who we are and, and what we're able to do because of our balance sheet size. And, and when you say that, does that mostly mean fixed income space? Are you talking catastrophe bonds? Are you talking about um, swaps on, I was trying to think of something weird. I can't even think of something funny. Um, swaps <laughs> on crypto. What is it? Um, well, what does that mean? Not, yeah. I mean, so catastrophe bonds, absolutely. You talked about sort of like just account receivable financing for, for different uh, companies, different corporates, um, you know, we'll do stuff in the emerging market space where uh, on the corporate side, which I think is, you know, sort of uh, particularly complex. And then a lot of deals were brought over the wall by the issuer in order to help sort of structure uh, on the private side deals that, you know, meet their needs, but also meet our investor needs um, that, you know, I think is where we really do use sort of financial engineering and structuring in order to, you know, sort of create really attractive opportunities. So I think that that's what's the most unique thing about PIMCO, where we we do things that some of our traditional sort of competitors are, are, are like not equipped to to really traffic in. Yeah. And so, you know, this, this answer may differ a little between you guys and then kind of what you would say to an individual. But, you know, PIMCO, long storied history, fixed income manager. What is the fixed income part look like? Is it all treasuries tips? Is it a worldwide blend of sovereigns? Is it, um, you know, corporate sort of like, like, how do you think about the, the fixed income space? Is there any particular landmines, any particular opportunities today? Yeah. So what I think is really interesting because I run 60, 40 funds when mm -hmm. on the, basically when you look at our competitors, they're all running the 60. They're not really running the 40. The 40 is yeah. basically investing in Barclays Ag and letting it do what it's do, it does. But all the tracking error, all the risk that they're taking is on the equity side. And it makes sense, right? Like equities are fun. Um, a lot of times the people who approach 60, 40 funds come from an equities background. It's, you know, higher octane. You can get more volatility, more return. And people think that within fixed income investing, it's largely pulled to par and, you know, it's sort of the more boring sort of aspect of, of multi-asset investing. But what we actually do, which I think sets us apart, is we are actively investing and driving alpha on the 40 portion of the book as well. And that is by, you know, diversifying pretty meaningfully 
the fixed income portion of our portfolio away from just, you know, sort of a Barclays Ag or sort of a, a boring treasury portfolio. Um, investing in emerging market bonds, investing in high yield corporates, in, uh, you know, corporates um, globally, not just in the U.S., uh, investing in munis, investing um, in in uh, real rates as well as as uh, nominals, um, investing in you know much wider swath of in terms of uh, opportunities than what you see in you know tra sort of traditional multi asset funds. So it, this is not hard. It's just that people don't do it, um, and and so. You know, I think that right now there's really ripe opportunities within fixed income, just given the fact that, you know, I think right the way that most of the market is set up, it's just not set up to take advantage of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, we've managed to do an entire macro conversation without any reference at all to crypto. Mm -hmm. uh, what's uh, what's PIMCO doing? What are you guys thinking about that in any uh, capacity at all? So right now we we have a number of work streams that are really focused on how do we approach crypto and how do we do it in a way that's appropriate for our clients. It's and we spent a lot of time over the last couple of years studying it, researching it. I, I sit and rotate on our investment committee at Pimco, and you know every month or so we're having a crypto conversation um, in terms of like how we're thinking about it as a business. The volatility of the asset class right now is such that, you know, we don't think it's appropriate for the average investor, um, just given the fact that it is highly volatile. And it's also not a good hedge within client portfolios, given the fact that it tends to be somewhat correlated to overall market risk and risk sentiment. And so I think initially people were thinking crypto was a great hedged asset for the rest of their portfolio. But what we found in practice, you know, particularly over the last 18 months or so, is that it actually has just added fuel to the fire of your the risk in your portfolio, particularly during you know down periods of risk aversion in the market, which is really not what you want. Um, so you know, it doesn't perform like gold, you know, as an example. Um, and so you know, I, I I think that when you're thinking about investing in crypto, you have to realize it's you're taking a very highly speculative bet. Um, it's not going to, and, and it's a, a bet, it's really not an investment uh, for sort of the long term, unless you're willing to sort of put it in a side pocket and check on it, you know, every couple of years um, and, and take that sort of longer term bet on it. And so it, it's hard uh, to sort you of- would, you would, I, How many people on the planet do you think could own some crypto and check on it every couple of years? Not even yeah, crypto, exactly. any investment on the planet. Like that's a- that's a good idea for an app or a brokerage where it like, it's like a lockbox. You put it in and it's like, you are not allowed to touch this for one, three, five, ten 10 years. If you look, it's like a penalty, <laughs> you know, that'd be the only way to get around it. But I think it's like a check, all my crypto friends check crypto. Yeah, like hourly. every minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, that, but that's the problem, right? Which is that it's this, um, and that that's led to sort of this hot, high octane volatility environment for, the asset. And so I think that there's probably a lot more maturing that needs to occur in the asset class before we'll really feel comfortable, um, you know, putting dollars behind it. That's not to say that, you know, we, we won't. Um, but right now, if you think about sort of the, the added benefit that it brings to multi-asset portfolios over the short term, it's really hard to model that in any type of risk system um, that would make us feel comfortable allocating capital to it. Yeah. Um, you've been at some pretty, uh, storied shops over the years. Um, how has your macro perspective changed? Um, is there any sort of, uh, as you grow more experienced and through different cycles? I mean, we've been through a couple of interesting ones. We both graduated sort of right after the internet bubble, which feels like there's a couple, um, uh, rhymes with today with some things going on um anything that you've re like really changed your opinion on or that surprised you or you spend a lot of time scratching your head about here i think mm -hmm. you know I, i've had a number of, of sort of life lessons over the last you know sort of 15 years or so in terms of 
understanding correlated risks within the portfolio and have gotten burned a couple of times um, in, take, in terms of not understanding how the portfolio would perform, particularly in significant sort of risk off periods um, where the risks become you know, highly correlated. You can model the risks as, as well as you want in normal environments, but when you, you know, sort of hit these pockets of risk aversion, you know, correlation goes to one and everything trades sort of in line with one another. So I think understanding that has probably been the biggest sort of lesson that I've learned and learned painfully along the way in terms of managing risks in the portfolio. And it's really hard then, you know, to think about how, you know, different asset classes are going to perform when they perform you know, 99% of the time, you know, in, in one fashion, but then they perform completely different when, you know, sort of everything, uh, you know, sort of risk, you know, sort of hits the skids and everything goes, you know, to, to a one correlation and perform very, very differently in that environment. And so sort of being able to, to manage a portfolio that, you know, does provide enough, you know, sort of potential upside uh, in good times, but also isn't going to really crack in the downside. Um, has been sort of, I think, the biggest challenge and the biggest um, thing that I've worked on in, in ter terms of portfolio construction. And we saw that really play out um, in terms of the last sort of 18 months with the pandemic, where, you know, growth was slowing um, coming into 2020. And there was sort of an expectation that, you know, as long as you were long defensive assets, they were going to do well. Um, but, you know, we, we, came into a crisis that was unlike anything that we'd seen before. And, you know, markets sort of cratered very quickly um, and sort of being able to have the fortitude to sort of first shed risk in an environment where things were rapidly falling and being able to sort of get liquid fast, um, but then also being confident enough when you hit bottom to start to put back risk back on in the portfolio, I think is what certainly saved us last year, but so also saved a lot of investors. Um, and so being able to be nimble, be quick, um, and, and not be overly stubborn in terms of how you manage risk in your portfolio has been, I think, the biggest thing that I've worked on and, and hopefully learned uh, over the last 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, as we look out to the horizon, so it's the end, coming down to the end of 2021, Anything on your brain that you're particularly worried about, you're particularly excited about, particularly confused about, you're scratching your head about? Is there anything that's uh, keeping you up at night? I mean, I think inflation is, is one of the things keeping me up at night. I'm not really so worried about the Fed tapering. You know, there's a lot of ink spilled in terms of discussing Fed tapering. And I think we've learned over the last 10 years that you know, these market gyrations that may be caused by, you know, the Fed tapering or removing accommodation, you know, largely can be, if you look over a longer time horizon, usually, you know, tend to heal themselves that the Fed, you know, doesn't want to disrupt financial markets too much. You know, I also think, though, that, um, you know, as we look out over the next you know, sort of three to five years, how ESG adoption is going to, you know, sort of infiltrate into finance. I think there's going to be pretty significant sort of winners and losers from that. Um, and, and maybe it's a longer super secular discussion for, you know, ESG adoption. But, but I do think as the result, you're going to need to see orphaned assets and dislocated assets. And, you know, right now are trading at, you know, decent multiples. But I think if you think, if you look out over the next, you know, sort of, at least five to 10 years, you're going to see very different market receptivity to financing those assets. And so that's something that I think um, the market needs to wake up to as well. So I take away your terminal, I take away your desktop and I say, Aaron, you're only allowed a, a couple of your favorite charts, indicators, uh, pieces of information. Like what, what do you rely on? What are some that you say, look, this is one that I'm if given no other information, these are some of my favorite frameworks to, to assess what, what is going on in the world. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I think there's three things that you, you need to focus on, maybe four. One is business sentiment. So you know, having a reliable indicator for business sentiment, I think, is, is key. Second is financial conditions or liquidity. 
Um, and then third is inflation and fourth is growth. And so those are the four things that you, you want to have, you know, your eye on. Um, and so everyone has sort of different favorite indicators for, for each of them. I think for inflation, you want to look at sort of longer term inflation expectations, what the market, you know, sort of is pricing in. So looking at 10 year break evens, I think is, is a good starting point, at least um, if I can only choose one indicator for inflation. Uh, you know, for, for business sentiment, you know, I think that the U.S. tends to have the best business sentiment indicators. So while you're sort of ignoring the rest of the world, I think at looking at um, business sentiment indicators, whether it's, um, you, you know, the UMICH, um or, or ISM probably would be the best indicator for that. For growth, for me, I think looking just at um, consumer confidence, it's a sentiment indicator, but looking at that as a leading indicator for growth is, is probably what the one sort of indicator I'd want to be focused on. Um, and, and then, you know, sort of lastly, uh, looking at financial conditions, you know, I'd, I'd probably look at bank lending surveys um, to give me some type of you sort of profile for what lending conditions are doing uh, for, as a financial indicator. So I, I guess if, if I had to narrow it down to sort of those four indicators, that's what I'd be looking at. What, um, any comments generally on what does the sentiment feel like today? And so, you know, I, I'm not sure if you're talking specifically towards like CFOs or CEOs or business owners, or if you're talking about retail investors or professional investors, like what, when you talk about sentiment, like what are you kind of referencing? Well, I, I think for for business owners, I think the sentiment right now has been quite robust, but is starting to become a little bit more worrisome just because of the supply chain shortages. And you, you see that in the comments of the, the ISM surveys. Um, there's a pretty bifurcated world right now between large caps and small caps, where small caps are having a much more difficult time. If you look at SMEs uh, in terms of obtaining materials, obtaining goods, dealing with the labor challenges um, that are afflicting them right now, and and seeing you know their margins compressed versus you know larger caps, which have better visibility into um, you know, into what their, their margins are likely to be because they have, you know, more control in terms of their supply chains, um, albeit they're being somewhat tested right now as well. Um, retail sentiment, I think, is still pretty good, although I think it's starting to, to inflect as well. I mean, the retail investor has been doing really well in the stock market over the last year. Um, you know, they've been buying every dip and that's worked out well for them. In general, they've you know been the beneficiary of a pretty significant fiscal stimulus transfer to um, you know sort of the household balance sheet, um, and up until recently, you know inflation has been pretty muted. So, you know from their perspective, they're sitting on a lot of cash that they've been investing, and that's you know done well for them. Um, but you know I think that that is starting to slow from the professional investor side. You know they've been a little bit more reluctant, particularly in the last couple of months. You've seen. You, know, you can look at a, a number of different risk sentiment indicators in the market, or even just looking at call skew in the market that you know sort of tells you that you know sentiment is starting to ebb in terms of professional investor sentiment. So you know I think we're at this really critical juncture right now um, where you know we we've sort of picked the easy pickings over the, the last sort of twelve months in terms of market returns, and it's going to get a lot choppier and a lot more uncertain uh, over the, the next couple of months. Yeah, interesting. Um, I see you're a scuba diver. You've been out to Catalina, Channel Islands. Where do you go? Are you uh, only a warm, warm water diver? So I've done both. I've done both warm and cold. I certainly prefer uh, warm water diving. My favorite places to dive are probably in Indonesia, Raja Ampat, Komodo, um, uh, you know, I think I've been to Raja Ampat a couple of times and it's pretty hard to beat the the manta rays there and the schooling sharks. Um, but I did do a dive off of Cabo a year ago and went to dive with the hammerhead sharks um, because they have, you know, hundreds, thousands of schools of hammerheads um, off the coast of, of southern Cabo and was diving with hammerheads, sort of immersed in them, you know, and all of a sudden, probably about 10 to 15 feet from me, 
from my from my left comes a humpback whale just like cruising oh right by and it literally blew my mind um i totally forgot about the sharks couldn't care less about them it was the most spectacular diving moment i've ever had in my life um, i had a similar experience which wasn't quite as as amazing but close um, when i was diving off of alor in in southern indonesia and had a whale shark come like cruising right by me. Um, but but I, I sort of had anticipated that because I knew there were whale sharks in the region. I had no idea that I'd, I'd never seen a whale diving before. So that was like one of the most spectacular moments of my life. Having you know a son uh, during the pandemic was, was definitely another spectacular moment of my life, <laughs> but they're, they're both pretty much up there. So um, yeah, it was, it yeah. was pretty, pretty cool. That's great. You know, I was, um... Was was the hammerhead diving towards the like Sea Cortez, like Cabo Pomo? Was it? That, was yeah, it, kind of that it was a little bit. Yeah, it was a little bit south of Cabo Pomo, but yeah, it was yeah. in the Sea Cortez. I remember it being really cold there. I went with my brother many years ago. We were kind of bahaing around the peninsula, and uh, and I remember it was like ice cream headache the whole time um, in that part of the world. But sounds that that whole Sea Cortez is absolute uh, gem treasure of a place. Um, whale shark sounds like a pretty special experience as, as as well as the humpback just cruising on by yeah i mean um, i i love shark diving it's sort of my passion so the more sharks i can see i've done shark diving off of um you know off of florida where we like dove with bull sharks like it's something that really excites me so it, it's one thing that can clear my head for markets so when i try to do it you know particularly when i need a break from markets for a couple of hours yeah, the um, I'll take the other side of that trade. So we're uh, that's what makes a market. I, I can do without seeing uh, seeing the sharks. You know, it, I'm a fairly terrible surfer and go here locally in, in um, Manhattan Beach. But they talk to the lifeguards and they say, yeah, most days people say they see a baby great white shark. And I say, I'm just I'm happy not to know. I know they're there. <laughs> I, I don't if I never see them, it's fine with me. But I've always wanted to go out to the Channel Islands um, uh, as uh, in Catalina. But it's just a little kelpy. It's a little great white sharky for me. I don't know, um, but uh, uh, I could be convinced. We'll see. Um, Aaron, this has been a, a great romp around the world. Uh, people want to find uh, more of what you're doing, what you're up to. What's the best place? Is it go to PIMCO? Um, where, uh, where can they track uh, your, your ongoings? Yeah, so if you go to PIMCO and just like search my name, Aaron Brown, um, you'll see all the funds that I manage all the content that I put out, um, everything that I write. Um, you'll see my picture, my bio, all of that on information. So that's probably the best place. And in some ocean in Indonesia. Aaron, it was a blast. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the, the time and the conversation.